Hey guys, how you doing? It's Jobwise Jones here. I just did the video yesterday, the NHA CCMA telling you how to prepare for the test, but now let's get right down to the nitty gritty, okay? This is going to be about phlebotomy to get you prepared for the NHA CCMA test. First question we're going to ask you, of course, is going to be which is thicker, a 21 gauge needle or a 23 gauge needle? So which is thicker, right? Which is a thicker needle, the 21 or the 23? You tell me what it is, okay? You get one second. Boom, one second's done. <laughs> it's a 21 gauge needle, all right? The reason why is because the higher the gauge, the thinner the needle, okay? Always the higher the gauge, the thinner the needle, okay? Number two, where does a thermal puncture take blood from? Good question, right? So where does a dermal, D-E-R-M-A-L, puncture take blood from? So think about that, right? Where does it take blood from? It takes blood from the capillaries. And the reason why you're going to go this route instead of the usual veins, because the veins are really bad, right? People who have had diabetes for 20 plus years, their veins are almost like rock. They're hard to get into, right? So you might go through instead, do a dermal instead, okay? Because you want to get to the capillary if you have to. Let's go into colors of tubes, right? Green blood draw tubes contain which additive? So when it comes down to the green tubes, right? What additive is in there? What additive is in that green tube? What is it you think? It's going to be for heparin, okay? A heparin. That's what they are. The additive in there is heparin, okay? Here we go. So for your winged, W-I-N-G-E-D, infusion sets are the preferred equipment for which patient population? So in plain English, which type of patients are going to, you're going to use the winged infusion sets for who who are these populations uh typically who <laughs> the elderly uh pediatric patients people with difficult veins you know um also they're also called butterflies most when i was in ma we called it butterflies too so you'll hear the word butterfly a lot but it's really called a winged infusion okay here's a good one for you guys for phlebotomy what is the maximum amount of time a tourniquet should be left on a patient. So again, what is the maximum amount of time a tourniquet should be left on a patient? What's that answer you think, guys? What's the most amount of time you think? Hmm? It should be for one minute, one minute only, okay? That's all you want for the tourniquet. Once it's on, you get that blood, get that thing off, okay? That's what you gotta do. When using an evacuated, E-V-A-C-U-A-T-E-D, when using an evacuated tube system, what equipment is needed? Again, when using an evacuated tube system, what equipment is needed? That's a good, good, yeah, good question, right? So you need a plastic tube with a vacuum, first of all, a double point needle, and a plastic holder and adapter. That's all you need, those three, okay, you guys? So try to remember these, these questions coming at you, okay? The answers, of course, but sometimes you also find the answer will be within the question as well. Just really think about these questions when you see them on your tests, okay? This is full body, let's keep on going, all right? What is a normal platelet count? What is a normal P-L-A-T-E-L-E-T -E count platelet what is a normal platelet count okay what can that be let's think about this okay mm, what can it be right 150,000 to 300,000 that's the average for normal platelet counts okay also to this point here I want to stop and tell you guys thank you my looky loo count is going down we have 81 percent of people come here look around and then they go away don't do that support this channel we are really trying to help our ma's get out there uh get the name known because a lot of people still don't know what ma's even are channels like mine really boost that you know also i'm not a medical assistant i'm a hospital administrator so i'm here to really support the career field because many years ago i was an ma when no one knew who we were what we did or whatever i'm really trying to push this professional career to where it belongs i think right now 
there's not enough respect yet for the MMA career. This is why I do this. So if you see these videos, hit subscribe, hit like, leave comments. You know, let's let this thing grow, okay? All right. How is an erythrocyte sedimentation rate determined? Okay, right? Good one, right? So how is an, I'll spell it, E-R-Y-T-H-R-O-C-Y-T-E, -E, erythrocyte sedimentation rate determined? What is that? Think about this question because part of the answer is in the question and the part of the answer is under sedimentation. Sedimentation means what? To settle at the bottom, right? Think about that question, all right? How is an erythrocyte sedimentation rate determined? A blood draw determines the amount of time it takes for red blood cells to settle at the bottom of the tube, you see? So part of the strategy here, you guys, when you see these questions on this test, right? Look at the question because sometimes the answer is right there in the question, right? Sedimentation rate, you're settling, right? It's gonna settle at the bottom, that's what you're doing. There we go, guys, okay? That's the strategy I want you guys to use, okay? What complications may result from a venous puncture? What complications may result from a V-E-N-O-U-S puncture, okay? And the reason why I'm spelling these things out to you guys is because I want you to know or remember how to spell these words too because you're going to get hit with this in the terminology section of the test. So I want to make sure you guys are ready, right? You know John Wise Jones. I'm always trying to prepare you guys, okay? So what complications may, may result from a venous puncture? Well, there's a couple, okay? Hematoma, hematoma, excessive bleeding, or nerve injury. Man, you guys, these are huge ones, right? Especially the nerve injury, you know? This is a deal I tell you before in the medical law part. You gotta make sure you know what you're doing. If you don't know, or if you can't hit that blood after two times, I would stop, ask for help, ask for somebody else. I've heard people get stuck like four or five, six times, you know, by the same full bottomness. Don't do that. You know what? You're not going to be successful every single time you do a blood draw. It just isn't going to happen. Nobody out there has a 100 for 100 hit. No one has it. I did about 80%. I had like seven years behind me. So after two times, I would go somewhere else. But of course, it depends on what the policy is in, in, in your department or, you know, what the manager says or whatever. But for me, it was two. After two times, the same patient, I go have him go. I bring another, another colleague in there or, you know, something like that. But I wouldn't try again after two times. Two times was my, my limit. What interventions should be done if there is a lack of blood flow from a vein? So here we go, right? So you're doing the phlebotomy, right? So what interventions should be done if there is a lack of blood flow, so none, no blood flow from the vein, what should you do? Good question, right? Mm, what do you do, right? You could reposition the needle. That's, that takes some skill, right? You could reposition the needle, remove the needle and try at a different site, or remove the tourniquet. Because sometimes that tourniquet can work against you to stop all flow, right? Depending on how tight you do that thing, you know? So there are strategies when you don't even have blood flow, there's ways to get blood flow, okay? You can all uh, reposition the needle, okay? Number two is remove the needle and try again at a different site or remove the tourniquet. Those are the ways you can sit down there and hit, hit that vein again if you want to try again, right? What are the five types of white blood cells? Five types, right? So what are the five types of white blood cells? Five of them, what are they guys? Lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils. I'll spell eosinophils. E-O-S-I-N-O-P-H-I-L-S, -S, eosinophils, neutrophils, N-E-U-T-R-O-P-H-I-L-S, and basophils, B-A-S-O-P-H-I-L-S. Those five are the five types of white blood cells, okay? Let's keep on going, you guys, okay? 
What is the recommended order of blood draws? <clears throat> Again, what is the recommended order of blood draws? Now, the keyword here is recommended, okay? You have to make sure you check with your clinic because they might have a couple things that are different than this recommended list I'm going to give you. So what, what is the recommended list of blood draws? First is blood cultures. Always get blood cultures first. That's going to be no matter where you go. I know this already. Red, red tube, red gray tube, blue tube, lavender, green, pink, and then the gray. That's how you want to do that, okay? And the reason why the National Committee of Clinical Laboratory Standards recommends that, but like I said before, if your clinic has a different order, then you want to go by whatever order they say, okay? Because remember, it didn't say this is it. It said we recommend this. We recommend the blood cultures first, red tube, red gray tube, blue tube, lavender tube, green tube, pink tube, and then of course the gray tube, okay? So that's what they recommend, all right? Whatever it is, make sure you understand for the test what the state recommends. Now, usually state recommendations follow the federal, right? <clears throat> so if the National Clinical Laboratory, blah, blah, says this is how you do it, make sure you memorize that for your test because the federal dictates for the state and so on and so forth, okay? So there we go. So you guys, with the exception of red tubes, what are the three types of additives that may be added to test tubes? That's a good question, right? So with the exception of the red tubes, so red tubes aside, what are the three types of additives that may be added to test tubes? Good one, huh? It's a good one. It's a really good one. Clot activators, thrombin, and anticoagulants, okay? That's the big deal. Those three, clot activators, thrombin, and anticoagulants, okay? Those are the three. So when it comes down to an LFT, liver function test, what is included? What's included in a liver function test? It's a good question, I know. This one, guys, I want you to memorize because you probably will get hit with this on your test, okay? I've got enough feedback from my medical assistants over the years that I know this one comes up in the test time and time again. A-S-T, A-A-S-T, one. A-L-T, two. C, sorry, G-G-T, three, right? Last one is P-T, okay? Again, A-S-T, A-L-T, G-G-T, and P-T. So the A-S-T and A-L-T, if they're elevated, it indicates liver inflammation, okay? That's those first two. The G-G-T will show a bile duct disease. So an elevated GGT shows a bile duct disease. And the last is the PT. Usually considered shows you, will show you liver cirrhosis. That's, that's, they're all serious, of course, you know, my gosh, but just remember those three. Okay, guys, put that to memory. What types of medications interfere with the FBS, the fasting blood sugar? So what kinds of medications interfere with an FBS? What do you guys think? Aspirin, steroids, and diuretics, okay? <clears throat> so aspirin, I'm not sure why, to tell you the truth. Steroids, I know sometimes in the chemical pounding of steroids, it bonds with, with, with fasting blood sugar, so it can alter the course, okay? And diuretics, of course, what do diuretics do? They water down, they, they minimize, okay? So that's why you might have a, an incorrect F, fasting blood sugar, if you're on diuretics, it won't give you accurate blood sugar rating because you have a, a, a dilated, a dilated uh, sugar rating, okay, already, all right? So those three, of course. So you guys, those are the 15, uh, 16 questions I've given you for your test for your NHA CCMA regarding phlebotomy. So you think phlebotomy is just about poking somebody and, and no, it's not. The test is gonna ask you more behind the scenes of that, of that just taking out blood. I mean. Many of you already know how to take blood, but they want you to know the science behind it. It's kind of like you own your car, right? To me, phlebotomy is like driving the car. But the test of that is, you know, do you know where your wheels are at? 
Do you know how to change a tire? Do you know how to put on the signal? Do you know where your wipers are at, the location to turn on your wipers, you know? Things like that. It's more, on this test, it's more than just beyond just taking out blood. Because what happens when you get into the field, patients will ask you questions like that. And the more information, the more knowledge a medical assistant has, the better off you look for you for sure. You can educate your patient. And plus, you boost up the career field itself, right? You boost up the image of the medical assistant career field. This is why it's important for me. This is why I do these videos, okay? Because I want you guys to be armed with knowledge, okay? Nobody can defeat you when you're armed with knowledge, okay? You guys have a great day. If you have any questions at all, any concerns, let me know. Leave me some comments. Please subscribe for sure. Please spread the word. I'm here to help you guys. Let's get it going, okay? That's Phlebotomy for NHA CCMA. You take care and have a great day. Bye-bye.